Hello friends and welcome back to the dork side. I'm the dork in the road. This is my 3,000 mile review of my 2022 Norden 901. I'm the dork in the road and I want to be your internet riding buddy, so please consider subscribing. We're doing this review Ian style, so if you don't follow Big Rock Moto, you should, because he has the most in-depth and comprehensive reviews of motorcycles on the planet, but he always like sits in his driveway next to the bike and kind of talks about it with his notes on his phone, and that's what I'm going to do right now. So shout out to Ian Big Rock Moto, go follow him if you don't. This is my 2022 Norden 901, I've had it for six months now, I've put 3,000 miles on it, I've ridden it 500 miles up to Canada on the road and back on the Washington BDR. That was a 1200 mile trip. I did a weekend training expedition in Bend, learning to improve and hone my off-road riding skills, my adventure bike skills on some sandy, technical, varied terrain. I've gone moto camping on it. I've ridden it all over the place. If you've never seen one of my reviews before, this is definitely more of a, what's the experience of riding and owning this bike for 3000 miles and less of a every single technical spec. You can get that from the website. I feel like, so I always try to concentrate on what it's actually like to ride and own this motorcycle. One thing to know going into this review, if you haven't been around the channel before, if this is your first time here, if it is, maybe consider subscribing, but uh, I've always been a skeptic of non-Japanese motorcycles. This is the first non-Japanese motorcycle I've ever bought, and I've always said that KTMs are unreliable, that I'd never own a KTM, that that's not something I'm interested in with all the maintenance and all of that, so that's the boat I was in before I got this bike. But I decided that it was maybe time to put my money where my mouth is and actually give a different bike a chance. So I just want you to have that background information uh, because a lot of this review is talking about whether or not that opinion has changed uh, over the time that I've owned this bike. So let's talk about what I like, what I really, what I love about this bike. And I think the first and most important thing to talk about is just how fun it is. It is an insanely fun motorcycle to ride, whether you're trying to carve up twisties, whether you're tearing up a gravel road, whether you're taking on a technical hill climb, it is always fun and it's just so intuitive. It always seems to know what I'm trying to do. It makes me a better rider in a lot of ways, which is actually a double-edged sword, which I'll talk about a little bit later in the review. But first and foremost, if I had to describe this bike in one word, that word would be fun. It is fun. Every time I get on it, I'm excited. Big old grin on my face. And that's a big reason why I took it on the Washington BDR instead of my Tenere. It's a very fast bike. It's easily the fastest bike I've ever ridden. And no, I don't have a ton of street bike experience, but in terms of adventure and dual sport bikes, this thing is fast. Like it hauls ass. It has what I like to call piss your pants power. The first time I got out on it, I thought I knew what I was doing having owned an Africa Twin and having recently bought a Tenere 700. But no, you twist that throttle and it's got a lot more than you expect. But it's not just fast, it's also quick. And those are two different things. So top speed, unbelievable, uh, super fast bike, but it'll get there very fast. It's also nimble and accelerates really quickly. So that all plays into the it's super fun to ride thing that I'm talking about. It's just, it's just a very fast, very quick bike uh, in a way that you wouldn't expect from an adventure bike. That surprised me. The thing about the ride modes on this bike uh, and the electronics and the computer, you know, some people might say that's a con. There's a lot of electronics. There's a lot of, of, of moving parts that might break or have to be repaired. But when it's working, it is mm, chef's kiss. It is unbelievably intuitive. This bike makes me a better rider every time I get on it because it evens out my mistakes and really lets me ride as hard as I want with a sort of a safety cushion. Like I know that if I give it too much throttle in a corner with off-road mode on, it's gonna slide out a little, let me power slide, but it's not gonna let me like low side. It really takes care of you. And the same in the twisties, on the street. Uh, I've made it a challenge, leave it in street mode and I go out and I carve up these twisties and I want to see how hard I can push it before the traction control kicks in. And that's not something I've done on any bike ever and I'm really finding that the edge is much farther off than I thought it was. It makes me ride a lot less conservatively because I feel like I have a little bit of a safety net. Speaking of electronics and gadgets, I love the TFT screen. I love all the options. I love the ability to get in there and customize things, to tweak things. I love explorer mode where you can tweak your traction control settings on the fly and adjust to the terrain as you see fit. It gives you different options for how the throttle response is. All of that is really cool and I'm just a big gadget whore. You guys know that. And so that appeals to me and so I have a ton of fun playing with all the modes and gadgets and things. It's a pretty user-friendly interface. It's clunky. It's hard to get to things with just a D-pad, you know, but it's not super confusing. It's easy to find what you're looking for. It just takes a lot of steps sometimes. This bike is incredibly 
nimble for its size. You look at it and it looks like a freaking aircraft carrier, especially with these even wider crash bars that I've got on there. That's the first response I get from a lot of people who haven't seen it in person. They go, whoa, that thing is big. And every time I, I haven't ridden it for a while, I think, oh man, this thing is big. And then I swing my leg over it and start riding and I forget immediately. It does not feel big. That's a consequence of all the fuel weight being down low and just the design, the suspension, the way that it all works together. It's a really fun bike to ride. It feels way more nimble than it is. And I've actually gotten in trouble because I think it feels so nimble I can get through narrower places than I can. So more than once I've dinged a crash bar on, the, on a log or a stump or something trying to get through a narrow space. But definitely feels more nimble than it is. It's very comfortable, probably the most comfortable adventure bike that I've owned. A lot of that is owing to this very wide seat. And yes, I have a seat concept seat on there now, but even on the stock seat, just the wide platform that distributes your weight so comfortably it makes this bike very comfortable to ride. The legs are in a very comfortable position. I like where the bars are for sitting down. I did have to put risers on for standing up. It's a very comfortable bike, even for long distances. I did not mind the 500 miles we did in one day. Uh, the worst part about that was the windscreen, which we'll get to in the cons. It's also super easy to get my feet down. That's the biggest difference I notice when I go back and forth between this and my Tenere, is on the Tenere, I'm always like, there's that split second where I'm not sure if my foot's gonna touch the ground. I don't have that at all with this. But it's just the design, the way the bike is, the way the seat is. It's so much easier. I feel like I can get both feet down very easily and I don't worry about having to waddle or, or get off the bike on uneven ground at all. Uh, for reference, I have a 30 inch inseam, so I'm not super tall, I'm about average height but I have challenges sometimes on certain bikes, but this one is very comfortable for me. I don't, I don't worry about not getting my feet down at all, so that's, that's a big plus. This is maybe less important um, in terms of subjective performance, but I think it's an incredibly good looking bike. I love the round headlight, I love the styling. I do not like the way the 890s look, but this Norden is so much better looking of a motorcycle. It's just got clean lines and the sweet round headlights with the additional lights on the front. I think it's a love it or hate it kind of thing because a lot of people will disagree, but the people that like it really like it. And people always want to come up and talk about it. Uh, people that haven't seen one in person are always coming up being like, oh, is that a Norden? Or, oh, what bike is that? It's, it's amazing looking. So it's definitely a head turner. It's definitely a conversation piece. And I, I agree that it's a very good looking bike. And, and you know, that is that the be all end all? No, but it sure is nice to get off your bike and want to look back and check it out because it looks so cool. You can't put a price on that, right? You probably can, but uh, I like it. Here's one I didn't think I would say about a KTM manufactured motorcycle, but the maintenance intervals are unbelievably long. They're over twice as long as my Tenere. 9,300 miles you're supposed to go between oil changes. Now, I don't know anyone that does that. Uh, I've got it actually set at 4,500, and I'll do 4,500 or once a year, whatever comes first. People always say, first thing you hear when you say, oh, I got a KTM or oh, I got a Husqvarna is, Oh, the maintenance intervals are really short. You don't want to do all that maintenance and it's not reliable. Well, I can tell you the maintenance intervals on this thing, 9,000 miles. Oil changes are not super easy, so I'm glad that it, they're so far apart, but, uh, but the longevity is there. It's good. Keep an eye on it. I wouldn't actually go 9,000 miles, but it's not 600 miles, which is what people seem to think every single Husqvarna and uh, KTM is. It's not the case with this bike. Surprisingly long maintenance intervals. Another thing I really like, uh, I sort of alluded to it already, but the off-road mode on this is insanely good. The conventional wisdom around off-road modes on modes on motorcycles is if you want to do any real off-road riding or if you know what you're doing, you turn those off, right? You don't want it interfering. I don't want interference with what I'm doing. I want to be in control of the motorcycle. And you know, on some bikes that I've ridden, that's very true. Uh, my Africa Twin was like that. I just turned everything off. It was intervening obnoxiously a lot. But this, I left it in off-road mode for the entire Washington BDR. I never felt once that I needed to take it out of that mode. It knows when you're trying to break the rear tire loose versus when you're just trying to maintain traction somehow. It knows when you're trying to give it a bur burst of speed to go off a jump. Um, it just knows what I'm trying to do. It understands what I'm trying to do as a rider. And it's just really impressive and, and intuitive. When that function is working, it works incredibly well. I have Explorer mode and I've barely used it because I like off-road mode so much. Off-road, it's been really good. And same for street mode. It's a, it's a whole different bike in street mode on the street and uh, I really feel like you can just carve up those twisties on it. So it's just fun to ride. Those modes are really intuitive and it's just, it's one of the standout features for me on this bike. It's not something I've had before on a motorcycle. In that same vein, the ABS is actually pretty impressive. On my Africa Twin, ABS was off the second I went off road. Tenere, same thing, it's too aggressive. But on this bike, I just leave it on. It's got really good brake feel. The brakes are really strong. And honestly, a little bit of ABS on the front is not a bad thing when I'm braking super aggressively off road because it keeps me from sliding the front tire as much, but I don't notice any of the issues I've had with off-road ABS on other bikes, such as not being able to stop on hills, things like that. It's not super aggressive, so again, it's just it's just intuitive. The bike just seems to know what I want to do. It works really well for me, and, and it and I jive really well. 
And that's all well and good, but no bike is perfect and the Norden here is no exception. So there are some things that I don't like about it. A really small but kind of annoying one is the dash settings, the favorites on the dash. So you can configure the dash however you want with whatever you want to show up, except you can't make your overall odometer be one of the things that's on the dash. That's stupid. So I just have one trip odometer I've never reset because I want to know how many miles I have on the bike without having to go into a bunch of menus. And two, and this is so nitpicky and maybe it's the English major in me, but it's a European kind of setting. And so instead of decimal points, you have commas and that drives me nuts. I hate that I can't change that. And it's not in the language settings or anything that I can tell. I'm stuck with fricking commas. Every time I look at the dash, it annoys me. So that's a small thing, but there are some actually more significant cons. The suspension is a big one. You hear people talk about this bike and its suspension. So supposedly it comes in in between the KTM 890S and the KTM 890 Adventure R. So it's not as hardcore, not as stiff, not as capable suspension wise as the R. And I think that's because this is definitely marketed more as a touring bike and less of a super hardcore off-road bike. Like the 890 Adventure R is like the most capable adventure bike out there are one of them right and this is a really capable adventure bike a cousin of that bike but so much more comfortable on the road that big seat the softer suspension it is very comfortable on the road and i don't think you lose that much off-road except the suspension is a big is a big notable factor now is it bottoming out all the time no and you can see that i'm a large person and i run a lot of luggage that was one of the biggest comments on my wobder loadouts was you took too much stuff and about the only time i bottom this out is when i'm going off jumps with all that luggage i have bottomed it a few times off of just regular jumps like on the training courses and stuff but it's not regularly bottoming out and you know i've got it cranked up and i could crank it up even more so um, take this with a grain of salt it's not a deal breaker but it isn't as good a suspension for hardcore off-road riding as the 890 adventure r if you're going to do what most adventure riders do and hit some gravel roads up once in a while and spend most of your time on the pavement you're actually better off with this bike the 890 the r is going to be uncomfortable uh, for long periods of time on the highway in a way that this isn't. So it's a trade-off, but I think at the end of the day on the balance sheet, you get way more road comfort than you lose off-road capability with this bike. And so in terms of a compromise, I think you're getting more for your money with this bike personally. But the suspension is a little soft. There are some quirks to the electronics. I, this is not a surprise with KTM engineering, but uh, the most annoying one is you set up, so we have favorite settings. So I've got it so that if I press up, I can change my ride mode. If I press down, I can switch out my ABS and it forgets that all the time. It's not like I'm disconnecting my battery or anything. It just forgets those settings. It's a very common issue. I'm in a lot of Norden owners groups and people complain about it all the time. So it hasn't been fixed with a firmware update that I'm aware of. I'm sure it will be on future versions of this bike, but that is a super annoying little quirk. And it got to the point where I just don't even set my favorites anymore because it's more of a pain in the ass to reset them all the time or have them not work when I need them to than it is to just go in and manually do the three more button presses to get me to where I'm trying to get to. But that shouldn't be a thing. It should work as advertised when you spend 14 grand for a motorcycle. So that's annoying. The windscreen is another huge complaint you'll hear about in the groups. People, the buffeting is pretty bad. It's not awful. Um, I wear earplugs. So it's just not amazing. The problem is there's not like a lot of aftermarket windscreens yet for this bike and there will be soon and it's not intolerable and supposedly you can put those little wings on the top of the screen and that helps a lot, but uh, the buffeting is pretty bad. So the windscreen is something people complain about a lot. Another annoying thing is that the, the aftermarket is really lagging behind. Uh, that's a consequence of a new bike coming out during COVID with all the supply chain issues and whatever. But a uh, good example is I've been trying to get heated grips since I got this bike. I still don't have them six months later. They keep telling me they're coming in two weeks, they're coming in two weeks, and they just never come. Particularly the factory Husqvarna stuff is not available. It's impossible to get your hands on. Now the silver lining there or the, or the caveat to that is a lot of the 890 stuff works, but there's not a lot of sort of bespoke Norden 901 stuff out there, at least not yet. I'm really sorry. I moved to the country to get away from noise. like leaf blowers and my neighbor just will not stop leaf blowing today. Dealer support is not the same as it is on a Japanese bike. So if you ride a Honda, there's a dealer in every reasonably sized town. Not so for Husqvarna. KTM dealers often will have what you need, but just it's not the same if you're gonna be going far afield out into the middle of nowhere. You know, there's a good chance you're gonna be able to find a Honda dealer. It's a little bit harder to find a Husqvarna dealer. So if that concerns you, particularly on a bike with maybe an iffy reputation for reliability, then, you know, that's a con. The airbox sucks. That's a complaint about all of the 890s and whatever. Uh, I've actually since replaced it with a power plate from Rottweiler Performance for better airflow and some pre-filtering, but my air filter was nasty, nasty clogged. And these engines are pretty sensitive to dirt and stuff. So it sucks if any of it gets past it. So it's really nice to upgrade that. I would, I would probably just factor that hundred bucks into the cost of your bike, or at least make it one of the first mods you do before you do any serious dusty off-roading. Another con is in my 
amateur, non-expert opinion, this is not a bike for beginners. Uh, you need some skill, some experience to really get the most out of this bike and to be safe on it. I think it's important that people understand that this is not a, I've never ridden a motorcycle before. I'm just gonna buy this 100 horsepower machine and I'll be fine. It's, it's not for beginners. It's barely for intermediate riders. I think as an intermediate rider, I, I can ride it safely, but I don't get every ounce of its potential out of it. You need a really good rider like Nathan uh, for that. And uh, a con, an interesting con to owning this bike is it really makes me ride like an asshole. Like uh, passing people in places I shouldn't be passing people or doing 100 miles an hour to pass four cars at once because I can. Because this bike is so fast, so nimble, it accelerates so well, it annoys me to be stuck behind people and I end up riding maybe a lot more aggressively than I want to or plan to or should be riding. But it's just so fun when you twist that throttle that you just want to do it more and more and I, it affects my decision making process in a way that I didn't expect. Yeah, one big con is that it may make you ride like an asshole. It certainly has me. Now the big elephant in the room with this bike, particularly because it's a brand new model, but also because it is a KTM or KTM manufactured bike, it says so right on the engine, manufactured in Austria in a KTM factory, is reliability. Like I said, the two things people say when you buy a Husqvarna or a KTM are, oh, it's not reliable and oh, uh, maintenance, maintenance, maintenance. How has reliability been? That was a big concern that I had. I've got 3,000 miles on it. That's not 100,000 miles, but it's not 200 miles either. The biggest issue I've had is one, the thing for getting my settings, like I mentioned, and two, uh, it's a pretty common issue where the radiator hose clamps are not tightened from the factory. And so on the first ride, I had it kind of steaming up because it was leaking. I tightened it. I have not had any issues since then. That's just my personal experience. So if we want a little bit of a bigger perspective, uh, I'm a member of a group on Facebook, the Norden 901 Owners Group, and somebody was like, okay, how unreliable are these bikes really? And put up a poll and everybody voted. I've had this issue, I've had this issue, I've had this issue. Hundreds of people voted. Uh, it was less than 10% who have had any issue at all. So you hear that that rear shock fails all the time, right? And you know, one prominent example, Ian from Big Rock Moto aside, that issue is maybe not really all that prevalent. At least in my experience to this point, those reliability concerns are overblown. That doesn't erase those concerns for me at all, but they are overblown in my experience to this point, which you know uh, was not something I was expecting. Is one of the reasons why I wanted to get one of these bikes for myself is to put my money where my mouth is and actually see if all the things I believed were true. And that was a big surprise to me as a, as I mentioned, former KTM hater. I talked a lot of crap about KTM bikes over the years, and this bike has proven me wrong, which is a cool surprise. Final verdict at the end of the day, after six months and 3,000 miles of riding and owning this thing, how do I feel about it? First thing I'll say is I've been pleasantly surprised by the reliability. That's a big feather in its cap, you know, and kudos to it for proving me wrong, and I'm, and I'm willing to admit that I might have been wrong. So if that's something you're worried about, my experience has been that that's not as big of a deal as I was led to believe it would be. It's incredibly fun to ride. It's a bike that I can push to the absolute limit of my own ability and maybe even beyond, and I know that these systems that exist in the bike will save me from making a big mistake. Uh, it's a little bit like turning on a cheat code in a video game, but it definitely does a lot of the work for you. And so I'm able to ride above my ability as a rider on this motorcycle. But as I mentioned, that's a double-edged sword because when it does a lot of the work for me, I'm not getting any better as a rider. I'm not learning, I'm not improving. And when I go onto another bike and expect it to do that, it puts me in a position where I could potentially hurt myself because I haven't built up the control and the skills to handle different bikes that don't have this safely. So if you're gonna ride this bike forever, that doesn't matter. If you switch between bikes like I do, it's maybe something to be concerned about. It definitely makes me overconfident on other motorcycles and that is a concern. That's a concern, particularly for a new rider or someone who's just building their skills. I don't want you to get in your head that, oh, I've gotten so much better. And then you hop on another bike and immediately hurt yourself because you're riding above your ability. I honestly did not expect to love this bike as much as I do. I did not think at all when I set up my whole Tenere versus Norden 901, which bike's gonna go on the Wamder competition, that this would be the bike that won. I was so shocked when I was like, I just really wanna ride the Norden because it's just more fun of the two bikes. I'm pleasantly surprised, great bike, super fun to ride, but there's an asterisk. I love it, but I don't trust it. And again, nothing that has happened in the time that I've had it informs that. It's just, it's really hard for me to go out on a long trip on this bike without having a little lingering doubt in my mind that is it going to get me there? Is it going to start every time I turn the key? And it has funky issues like I've had the immobilizer warning come on, you got to turn it off and reset it. So there's just little, little tiny things like that that make me worry that I'm not going to be able to finish my trip when I start it. And I just don't have those worries on the Japanese bikes that I've ridden. 
So it's fun, it's amazing, it's fantastic, but I'm never relaxed on it. It is the exact opposite of peace of mind. And that is a concern. You know, the only way to alleviate that concern is to ride it longer and learn how reliable it is or ride something else. And I love this bike. I'm very impressed with this bike. I've enjoyed it so far and I'm looking forward to continuing to test it and find out it, just how wrong I've been about reliability, but I can't stop thinking about it when I'm riding it. And so that at the end of the day is something to maybe factor in, especially if you're a, a Japanese fanboy like I am. Are you okay with that? Are you okay with knowing or at least feeling like you need to be prepared for disaster to strike, whether it's going to or not? So yeah, that's my time on the Norden 901. Love this bike, super fun. Really glad I bought it. Uh, I enjoy riding the crap out of it. I've ridden it harder and better than I have on any other adventure bike. Great bike. So if you have any questions about the Norden or my time on it, please feel free to leave them in the comments. If you have a Norden, what's been your experience with it? What's been your reliability experience with it? You know, a bunch of people are gonna chime in and be like, yeah, well, that's just your experience and they're not reliable, but uh, those people also probably haven't owned one. So if you've owned one, I'd, I'd really love to hear your experience and I think other people watching this video would appreciate that too. So thank you for watching, I appreciate you, and please do not forget to be excellent to each other. Oh, thank you. Excellent! Thank you.